Okay, so welcome to our lecture slash podcast on what is capital, Vibelen, absentee ownership, and sabotage. Before we start into today's uh, podcast or lecture, uh, let's just go through the story so far. So if you're following along in your slides, that's the second slide. So, so far we've been talking about political economy and its discovery that there is something new about the world. And what's really new is that for the first time in human history, we start to see economic growth or a really huge surplus of production and consumption. And of course, that's been over the last three centuries, and of course, it's been unequal. But one of the huge questions, of course, we saw was, well, what generates income and wealth? And that's Adam Smith's question in 1776. But then he also starts to have to explain the distribution of income uh, and wealth. And then political economy, other traditions like neoclassical economics and Marxian economics start to do that as well. They start to look at the distribution of income and wealth. And the big question here is, why do some have so much and so many have so little? So we already uh, took a snapshot of global inequality quality and we know about 1% of the adult population own about 50% of the world's wealth. So the question is, well, why is that? Right. And so two other traditions spring up to explain that. That's neoclassical economics and Marxian economics. And that's what we did last week. So for Marx, uh, he sees uh, the social relation of capitalism between workers and owners as fundamentally exploitative. Basically, for Marx, capital will be unpaid surplus labor. He believes that during the production process that workers are not paid the full value of your labor. That's the source and origin of profit for Marx. So why is there an equality uh, in this um, framework? It's because of the exploitation of labor. And this is the reason why Marx would advocate revolution and overturning capitalism and so on and so forth. And some Marxists, of course, today continue to do that. Now, the neoclassicals come after Marx. They're writing kind of around the same time, but really into the late 1800s after uh, Marx is dead. And they basically make capital, capital goods, or what we call equipment machines, anything workers really use during the production process to uh, create commodities or produce commodities. Now, we saw last week how um, this kind of understanding uh, is fundamentally flawed. It's fundamentally flawed because because we looked at the production function and the way the production function is set up says that we have to know the value of the inputs before we can tell anything about the distribution of the outputs. And we saw how because the value of capital is based on its future or future expected profits. So if we have the machine, we're going to what are we going to pay today for this machine is based on expected future profits. But if we don't know what those profits are exactly, this machine can have multiple values and therefore the production function breaks down. It's highly technical on, on, on some level, but uh, it's important to know because that means the um, theory of uh, neoclassical economics and its understanding of capital is fundamentally flawed and um, empirically unverifiable. And then in tutorial, just to remind us, we looked at uh, the concept of human security, uh, which stems out of the UNDP, and we looked at seven dimensions of human security, just to give us some idea, some guideline or baseline or index uh, for thinking about what's happening to human security throughout the rest of this subject when we encounter a number of other um, topics. Okay, let's get into today's uh, podcast and the outline, if you flip to the next slide. You'll see is Veblen's understanding of business and industry. Now, Thorsten Veblen was an American Norwegian uh, economist primarily, um, but he could you could classify him as a, a political economist as well. And why he's really important for us, and he's often ignored, um, shamefully, in my opinion. But why he's important for us is um, he basically is writing at the time of the modern corporation in the United States of America. And today, the modern corporation's epicenter is in the United States of America. There are more large firms in the U.S. and on the U.S. stock markets than there are anywhere else in the world, although, you know, China might change that uh, eventually. But Veblen is going to give us a distinction between business and industry, and we'll take a closer look at what he means by that. Then we'll look at the rise of the modern corporation. There's two major explanations for why we see this business form, right? So why isn't everything just small or medium businesses? Why do we have major corporations like Facebook and Google and Visa and so on and so forth? And one kind of track is that, well, it, it's to do with efficiency. We're reducing transaction costs, and these corporations are just way more efficient than a small or medium business enterprise would be. So that's kind of a docile understanding or a facile understanding or a kind of mainstream understanding of the rise of the modern corporation. A more critical view says that we see 
this form because it's basically based about control. It's about control of production for profit. So it has very little to do with efficiency per se, even though, of course, corporations can be efficient, but it's more about uh, control. So we'll take a look at that dispute uh, in a moment. And then examples of one of the key concepts of uh, Veblen, which is sabotage, uh, will follow towards the end of this lecture. Um, and we'll see how Veblen's concept of, of sabotage doesn't just mean you break something, um, but something more fundamental about what business is doing in order to garner profits to the production process. Okay, so let's start into our first point and look at, um, just before we get into Veblen's understanding of business and industry, we'll start to look at theories of property ownership. Now, if we start with John Locke, who's writing in the 1600s uh, in England, he has to give us an explanation for why property is unequal and divided up in a certain way in England. And he says that, well, you know, property is the result of an isolated individual mixing land and labor. So let's say you're out in the forest, you chop down a, a, a couple trees, you build a home, that's your property because you've mixed your own labor by, you know, cutting down the trees and building a home. Uh, with the products of nature. Now, out of this, he'll say that ownership entitles you to a stream of income or enjoyment of that thing. So as long as you don't harm others, if it's your property, you know, maybe you clear off a little bit more of the forest and you have a pasture and you have sheep and you use the wool from the sheep, you know, to make profit, um, you can do that because that's your property. You've, again, mixed your uh, labor with the land, you've you know paid for the sheep, you've reared the sheep, you've sheared the sheep, you've you know got the wool and so on and so forth, uh, and sold that on and marketed it, whatever. Okay, so that's um, Locke's understanding. Now, why we're going to bring up Locke, or why I'm bringing up Locke, is because he has an individualist understanding of private property. Veblen is not going to have this understanding at all. His ontological starting point is not the individual. It's human creativity and production, which only comes from a community. So he starts with humans as social beings always within a community. So he knows there's individuals, of course, but he doesn't see that these individuals are ever, ever isolated, really. Okay. Um, so wherever we find kind of pockets of humanity, they're always in, uh, of course, groups. And he's going to give us this idea of immaterial equipment or intangible assets. So it's kind of synonymous in his work. So if you ever read kind of the business enterprise or abstinence, abstinence ownership, um, you'll come across these concepts. And what he means here is the common stock of knowledge, habits, customs, and ways of life concerning production and reproduction, which is held informally by the great body of the people involved in the community. So just to give you an example, um, Let's take Finland. Finland, uh, in the Finnish society, love mushrooms. And it's a custom in um, summer to go out into the forest and pick mushrooms and then come back and cook them up and so on and so forth. Well, imagine that, you know, the Finnish are an eastern tribe who settled modern-day Finland, uh, you know, centuries ago. And basically, um, no one knew, you know, if a mushroom could poison them. So, of course, you know, this through trial and error and so on and so forth, we're going to figure out which ones are edible and which ones will poison us and might potentially kill us. So this common knowledge is is a social knowledge. It's not an individual knowledge per se. And it just spreads throughout the community so that most young Finnish, uh, you know, kids who will go out into the forest and, and gather mushrooms know which ones are poisonous and know which ones are edible. So that's kind of um, what um, uh, Veblen is getting at by talking about immaterial equipment or intangible assets. There's something, you know, about being in a social network or a social group that allows for greater knowledge than it would if you were just an isolated individual. So he's going to be radically kind of challenging Locke's understanding of, of property and, of course, uh, inequality. Okay, so um, here's a kind of a more difficult point, but uh, what he's going to say to us, if we go to the next slide... Uh, is that th as this immaterial equipment grows, as this common stock of knowledge grows, it becomes increasingly difficult to identify, let alone trace the connection between any given technological detail and any specific individual of the community. Now, this might be hard uh, conceptually to, to think about because we're always used to this idea that an individual invents something. But what kind of Veblen is trying to get at is that all this common stock of knowledge has to build up before that individual inventor or that individual person who finds 
something, right? A cure like penicillin, let's say, uh, or it could be now a cure for uh, coronavirus or, well, maybe not a cure, but a vaccine, I should say. So what he's saying is that, you know, no one could come up with um, a vaccine for a coronavirus uh, if all the history of all the knowledge about, you know, needles and viruses and biology and everything that would go into that didn't come first. So the example here I'm giving you on the slide is try thinking of it this way. Did Thomas Edison, that individual alone, invent the light bulb single-handedly? Or was the invention of the light bulb the end result of Edison employing the common stock of human knowledge towards that end? You know, just to kind of think about it or do counterfactual, you know, what if, what if he had been born in 1588, right, uh, rather than working in the 1800s, late 1800s, right? Um, so, you know, cavemen, for example, couldn't build a rocket ship. They just didn't have that common stock of knowledge. Today, we, you know, have that common uh, stock of knowledge that we can build rocket ships and so on. So anyhow, this is kind of what Veblen's getting at. There's There's something social about knowledge and customs, and somehow Babelin is going to say that capitalists um, and investors, what they do is they get a slice of that, they cut it off as their own private property, they exclude others from its use, and therefore they can derive an income stream from that. So for example, if we think of Jeff Bezos, who is the richest man on the planet and founder and major owner of Amazon, Babelin would never say that his individual productivity has been the source of his wealth. Veblen would say there's no way that an individual can be that productive to, you know, have that much money. So Veblen uh, would say that this is a social thing that he was allowed to create Amazon and, um, you know, listed on the stock exchange and so on and so forth. And this made him incredibly wealthy, but it has very little to do with his own individual t skills, talents and productivity. Veblen wouldn't deny that, of course, he used his own skills and efforts and education and so on and so forth to build Amazon. There's no doubt about it. But he would say that there's something disproportionate about that and the level of income and wealth Jeff Bezos has. Okay. So that's maybe a bit controversial for some people because we're used to, you know, thinking that the individual always invents something or it's down to the individual, um, you know, efforts and talents and education that gives them a certain income and a certain point of wealth. Babeland would completely argue against that idea. Okay, so um, if we start thinking about this way, if we go to the next slide and start to unpack this idea of industry and, and business, two of the concepts Babeland is going to talk about uh, quite a bit in his work, Veblen would say it's virtually impossible to advocate monopoly control over any discovery, let alone contend that the individual is the rightful producer and thereby owner of an intangible asset idea. So Veblen would be totally against, kind of like the neoclassicals, against monopoly control. Okay. He sees ownership, and this is important in distinction from Locke, uh, as nothing more than an outright seizure of a given portion, element, or fraction of the immaterial equipment of humanity, that common stock of knowledge. And has virtually zero to do with individual productivity per se, as I've just been over. So ownership for him is the result of a power process and it often originates in violence. He says it's a legal fiction and over time it has become sanctioned by law and backed by the coercive powers of the police and governmental apparatus. And again, he's not really talking about ownership and property in the sense of your home or a spoon or you know, your computer, he's talking about kind of the major productive, um, you know, facilities of society, just as Marx kind of was. So the examples here that we can give are the enclosure of the commons. That was a violent process that happened over centuries in Europe um, and elsewhere through colonialism. We could look at slavery, the direct ownership of, of people and their enslavement, colonial appropriation of land, of course. And we could even say that the patent system is a representative of that seizure of knowledge. It's individuals and corporations making claims saying, okay, well, I'm going to drive an income stream from this idea or invention, and everyone is excluded from ever doing what I've uh, set out to do or have invented for X amount of years. And, of course, we'll see later on that even pharmaceutical companies um, whose patents are expiring, uh, they're absolutely clamoring to uh, – you know, basically um, lobby the U.S. government to extend their patents. 
So the idea here is that they want uh, greater protection over more time. So um, again, we'll see this towards the end of the lecture. I got, an, I have a number of examples that we can uh, use to kind of think about uh, this ownership idea as being kind of exclusionary to derive an income stream. And again, you could agree with this or not agree with it, um, but that's how Veblen is starting to understand ownership and, of course, capitalism. So the example I'm going to give you right now is the proclamation line. So if you flip to the next slide, you'll see a... Uh, map of colonial North America, primarily the uh, United States. This is when Britain has control of most of Canada and um, the United States. And basically, one of the big, big grievances of the colonialists was that they couldn't get more land west of this proclamation line. Now, why did, you can see this line kind of on the map running through the Appalachian Mountains, right? Uh, why did the colonial um, settlers get angry at this? Well, basically Britain said there's no more going over and getting into native land and taking it over because when you do this, you provoke the Indians and they're going to start more wars. And wars are very pricey and Britain had already just been through a war. And of course, um, you know, they wanted to limit it, uh, the expensiveness of war. So they said no more settling beyond the proclamation line. This made the colonialists very angry because the way that they made money was, of course, through plantation economies. And so they wanted to push beyond the uh, proclamation line of 1763. And that's one of their chief grievances and one of the reasons why we will eventually get the American Revolution. It's not the only reason we'll get the American Revolution, but one of the first things that happens after the colonialists win uh, the War of Independence is they erase that proclamation line. And so, of course, you know, now settlers are allowed to continue westward and take over Native American uh, land. So this is kind of a, a violent process. And then, of course, they employed, well, I shouldn't say employed, they used uh, slave labor, of course, on these plantations in order to grow crops uh, for profit. So, again, a very violent process uh, that we can see. It's not a smooth process of, you know, an individual uh, just gaining uh, property by mixing labor uh, with their land. Okay. So now let's move to unpack uh, these concepts so now that we have kind of some background knowledge of how Veblen's kind of thinking about society, thinking about knowledge, thinking about ownership, and so on. So he's going to give us this concept of industry. And the idea here is that he sees that the industrial system is identified with the community, workmanship, and human interdependence. It is the materialization or the application of a heritage of human knowledge immaterial equipment and intangible assets or intangible assets. Remember, those two terms are pretty much synonymous in his work. And the goal of industry, basically, for Veblen is service ability to the community. So if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. Why would we set out to build something that breaks? You know, it makes zero sense from uh, the point of view of a you know, service ability uh, to the community. And in fact, uh, if we go back in history, most people's products were associated with their family names. And you would bring shame upon your family if you produced something that, you know, would break down or didn't show a certain level of uh, craftsmanship and so on. Of course, this all is going you know, to change over time as soon as the corporation starts to control production for profitable ends. So... Um, there's also a tendency towards standardization, itself concomitant of the fact that the mass that mass industry requires planning and coordination. So Veblen kind of gives us this idea of resonance and dissonance, right? We want resonance in industry. We want things to run smoothly. We don't want things, um, you know, to to stop or go badly or you know throw a spanner in the works and so on and so forth. Standardization is also very important because. Could you imagine if every um, electric socket in Australia was different or, you know, the 20 percent of buildings had this type of socket and, you know, the other 80, another type of socket and so on and so forth. Uh, it's already burdensome enough to go travel abroad and have to get that universal adapter and so on and so forth. No, we can do that. That's fine. But if you're thinking about rolling out a national kind of electricity grid, you would probably standardize sockets. That just makes sense, right? So you have resonance there rather than dissonance. And then last but not least here on this slide, uh, the livelihood of the community is best served by an unter uninterrupted and balanced functioning of the industrial process. So again, he sees industry as associated with the community, workmanship, human interdependence, and uh, you know that whole idea of, well, why would we set ourselves to task in making anything? Um, why wouldn't we make it the best possible, right? And why wouldn't we standardize things to make it easier for us and so on and so forth? And you could probably think of, of other examples as well of smooth functioning industry.
Okay. But he says business is, is radically different from industry. And he sees business as almost a parasite on industry. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see that uh, business uh, is erected upon industry and ownership implies exclusion and for him, sabotage. In fact, the ownership rights of a corporation or an individual gives them the right of sabotage, according to Bibland. And I'll unpack that in just a moment. And he says that profit really originates from this ability to exclude and the sabotage of production or the sabotage of the community. So he sees production as going against the serviceability of uh, the community. And again, this may be hard to take, but we'll unpack what he means. So the second point on this slide is that the business enterprise directs, controls, well, directs and controls uh, or controls production, not for the sake of production, for the betterment of human livelihood, but for profit. And the two are not the same thing, right? It is different if I say I'm going to produce food because I want to feed all of humanity. That's one thing, right? What's the goal? The goal is to feed all of humanity and I'm going to give them good, wholesome, nutritious food. It's a very different thing if I say I'm going to produce food and whatever that might be, heavily processed food, high, high in sugar food and so on and so forth, because I want at the end not to feed humanity, I want profit. So you can see the two logics are very different and that's what Veblen is trying to spell out to us. So in this sense, in the third point, is he's going to say that business is often counterproductive to human creati creativity, potential, and capacity. In fact, Veblen would say it sabotages creativity, potential, and capacity. It allows it to happen. So he's not denying you can, you, there, you can never have 100% sabotage of production, right, or creativity or potential or capacity. You have to produce something in order to sell, in order to make profit. But Veblen says is that the corporation is going to have a certain incentive to sabotage on some level so that we become kind of repeat customers. That's one kind of example. Okay, so if we move to the next slide, um, here's some examples of that, you know, those two different logics. So we can provide HIV, AIDS drugs and other vaccines that kill millions unnecessarily for virtually nothing. They, these cost peanuts. Once the initial work has been done, and usually that's coming from government grants and government university, government-sponsored universities, and so on and so forth. This research and development of drugs, right? Um, and all that common stock of knowledge allowed us to have uh, antiretroviral drugs that help HIV slash AIDS victims. Um, so we could do that. We could provide that for pennies on the dollar, right? to uh, millions of people around the world who are in, um, you know, who have succumbed to, to this um, virus. But this would impede, of course, the profits of the giant pharmaceutical companies, right? So if we allow, you know, cheap drugs to get to people and they don't get their markup, then they don't get their profit and so on and so forth, right? So again, two very different logics. Are we producing medications to help people or are we producing medications to, yes, that may help people, but ultimately the end goal is profit. And therefore, if these people cannot pay, then they don't get those medications, right? And we'll see. I'm, I'm obviously talking about HIV AIDS here, uh, but we'll see how during the pandemic we have similar forms of sabotage and corporate profitability. So there's your exclusion. There's your ownership. And this is what Veblen is pointing to. So um, you can also look at another example. We can provide free public access wireless at high speeds to almost all our communities. You know, this is technologically possible. Everyone I talk to who's involved in, in this, building networks and so on, knows that this is possible. But this impedes upon the profit of giant telecommunications companies that carve up the population. So this is why we have, you know, five or six internet companies in Australia, and they're all driving an income stream from their exclusion of other companies on the one hand from their market share um, and of course from the exclusion of basically free public access uh, wireless internet. And then a third example here, and I'll, we'll be giving you more towards the end of this lecture, we have the capacity to feed the world. So the FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN, knows that we have enough food to feed the global population. But again, we're not producing food just to feed people. We're producing food for profit. So if you don't have any land and you don't have any money uh, in this society and no one will give you food, you're going to starve, right? You're going to die of starvation or you'll be undernourished or malnourished, you'll be stunted and so on and so forth. So you can see the kind of logic that Veblen is trying to spell out. We're not producing for the community and the serviceability of the community. We're producing for profit and the two are not the same, same thing. Okay, let's move to the next slide. Let's move to talk about the rise of the modern corporation. And again, I told you at the very beginning of this lecture that there are two kind of major explanation, explanations. Sorry, uh, One is efficiency and the other is control. The efficiency argument is mainstream neoclassical argument. 
interpretation. And the control argument is basically coming out of a blend, but Marxists would share a lot of that analysis. So why corporations? Again, why, why, why isn't the world just filled with, you know, small little mom and pa shops and maybe some medium in enterprises, medium sized enterprises and so on and so forth, employing maybe 30 to 50 people? So the big question again, why corporations? Well, the dominant narrative is that the corporation arises historically because it is more efficient than alternatives. So the idea here is that vertical integration is just far more efficient and the reduction of transaction costs is very important as well. So if we bring everything in under the corporation, um, then we, we can reduce our risk of buying things on the market that we need to produce whatever it is we're producing uh, because we produce it ourselves. So let's say you're a car company. You know, uh, bring everything in house. Don't buy from a tire company. Make your own tire company and bring that in. So you're not relying on another firm and their price point, you know, to get your tires to build your cars. So that's kind of the general idea of reducing transaction costs. You can actually, you know, uh, price it in a way that's cost effective for you and your profit strategy when you want to sell cars. But the big problem here, if you think about it, is the corporation or firm isn't a building or a structure. It's a legal fiction and can own, own many enterprises. So that's the problem of the argument of vertical integration or transaction costs. Firms are legal entities. They're not physical structures, right? In law, they're legal entities. And so basically, um, this kind of kiboshes this idea that, you know, the uh, corporation or modern corporation has arisen uh, just because this is a more efficient way to produce goods and potentially services. So if we look historically, if we can actually look at the rise of the modern corporation, I have a picture here of John D. Rockefeller, the world's first billionaire and uh, very rich man who left an incredible legacy. Let's just look at an example of, of him and his Standard Oil Trust. Well, what did he do? He was an oil refiner and oil is incredibly easy to refine. You basically just boil it at this point in time. We were trying to make kerosene. And the major market here was for light at night, right? So before we were using petrol for cars, we're using uh, kerosene or petrol, um, a derivative of, of um, sorry, uh, crude oil in order to produce kerosene for sale on the market so people could illuminate their homes and their farms at night. So basically um, what Rockefeller did because there were a number of competitors was he put them out of business and he put them out of business in two kind of major ways. One, violently, and then two, he would undersell. Once he got big enough, he could undersell, undercut, and basically the other refineries couldn't afford to keep up production, and therefore the price or the value on the market would become cheaper, and he would just buy them up. And eventually we get the largest trust or largest corporation in American history up to that time, and eventually we start to see the government try to make efforts through antitrust law to break up uh, the Rockefeller um, Standard Oil Trust. So we won't go into too much corporate detail about that, but that's just an example of what Rockefeller is doing. He's not doing this necessarily for efficiency. He's doing it to gain control of the market because he understood if there was too much competition of these refineries, price is going to go down. And if price goes down, profit is going to go down. So what he wanted to do was really eliminate um, um, competition uh, for control and to make sure that Standard Oil received uh, its um, profit targets. Okay, so we can think of other examples of business sabotage. And again, remember, sabotage for Veblen isn't just about breaking things. Sabotage for Veblen is fundamentally about the restriction of production or creativity or potential. So there's a difference between what we can do as human beings and what the corporation will allow us to do because of profit. So, for example, the, the practice of hoarding food to boost food price, that's, you know, historically you can look that up in all kinds of cases. This happens uh, across all kinds of uh, countries. The other thing that you could look at, for an example, is the Sydney tram system, which was dismantled in 1961. And you could, you know, basically see these similar patterns happen once the Americans take over West Berlin after World War II. Well, if you're ever in Berlin and you want to know whether or not you're in East or West Berlin and you don't have your phone with you, all you need to do is look down or look at the street signs, or sorry, the street light walk sign, right? If you look down and you see tram tracks, you know you're in East Berlin because the Soviets never dug up the trams. Uh, 
If you look down and you don't see tram tracks, you know you're in West Berlin because basically the Americans said, fuck it, we're digging all this up and everyone's going to drive cars in West Berlin. So that's a key difference of, of knowing East and West Berlin uh, because the tram systems were completely destroyed uh, in West Berlin, just as they were in Sydney, which had the second largest um, tram network and uh, its user base was very, very high. But of course, that got in the way of introducing the uh, bus, which some argue is you know, more efficient at getting around, uh, and of course, the automobile. Australians wanted to drive cars and car companies wanted us to drive cars. And now you can see the mess of congestion that that's created throughout uh, Sydney if you've um, ever been up there and, or lived there or spent some time there. Okay, uh, and now, of course, we have a light rail, and that's uh, also debatable <laughs> of, of how successful that's going. Anyhow, let's move to the third example on this business sabotage slide. We can talk about Enron. Now, some of you are probably too young to remember Enron. It went bankrupt. It's defunct now. Uh, but it was an energy uh, corporation. And basically what it wanted to do was, of course, achieve profits, not necessarily provide people with energy. So in California, we have traders at uh, Enron who set kind of prices for energy production and consumption, uh, basically set up so that there would be blackouts and brownouts across, across certain uh, populations in California to boost the price. So it gave the citizens of California the false illusion that there wasn't enough electricity to go on. Um, you know, for everyone. And so basically this uh, allowed them to boost the price. They were caught out on this. They were fined and so on and so forth. But eventually uh, Enron, um, if you ever want to watch a movie about this, I think it's called The Smartest Guys in the Room. Uh, and that will give you the whole history of, of Enron and their shenanigans that led to their bankruptcy or their rise and their fall, really. Uh, HIV AIDS drugs we've talked about before. Um, and we didn't talk about the controversy. And the controversy here is that India primarily was producing generic uh, drugs, and these are the cheap ones, right? And they're selling those abroad, um, you know, to co uh, poor countries who actually need, you know, cheap pharmaceuticals to combat the HIV-AIDS crisis in their communities. And of course, what does the giant pharmaceutical companies do? They take them to the World Trade Organization um, and basically are suing them because they're saying, well, you're infringing upon our patents. So the jury's still kind of out on that. But again, you can see that difference between do we produce cheap generic drugs, which we have the potential to do for poor communities, or, you know, do we give this over to the uh, large pharmaceutical companies, tell the generic firms that they can no longer do this, and basically allow people to um, succumb to HIV AIDS. Now, there has been a development on this, so please check that video up on Moodle. The next example that we could look at is, um, you've probably seen the film. Um, if you haven't, I highly suggest it. It's Who Killed the Electric Car? So the, this uh, goes back um, to the early 1900s, actually. Um, that's when we were first starting to test and use the electric car. There's a whole history behind the sabotage of electric cars, and that generally has to do, um, some would argue to us, particularly Edwin Black, if you read uh, his book on this um, called um, Internal Combustion. If you read that, you'll get more detail than I can go into here. But the idea here is that um, the petrol companies were in cahoots with some of the car companies, and basically, um, remember at this time, we we're getting electrification. And that means we don't need to rely on kerosene for light anymore, right? We're generating electricity, whether that's through hydro or whatever it might be. And so as we're replacing kerosene with electrification, um, there's no real reason for, you know, kerosene anymore. We don't have a huge market for kerosene at this point in time. So you can imagine how threatened Standard Oil was and all the other oil companies were at this time because their commodity was no longer really needed by the community. So... It's argued, and it's you know, difficult to prove definitively, but it's argued that the oil corporations uh, combined with the automobile industry basically set up this dependent relationship so that cars would run on petrol rather than electricity. And that gave Rockefeller and all the other oil giants a reason to be. So all of a sudden, instead of refining oil into kerosene, we are now refining crude oil into gasoline or petrol.
So there's a whole history here of how the electric car gets killed, um, stemming from uh, the early 1900s. But this film, Who Killed the Electric Car, is about um, a, a car that was uh, an electric car that was um, sold, I think it was around 20, 25 years ago. And then they decided um, that they were going to, uh, and I think it's Chrysler, but don't quote me on that. Uh, they decided that they were going to recall the cars and just dismantle them. Right. Okay, so that's an interesting case, too, of, of sabotage. Another one you could look at, um, the second last point here, is academic presses and the journal system. Um, I'm, I'm paid by a public, um, by the public, by, by taxation, right? And when I produce research, just like any other academic produces research, um, we have to, um, you know, get it in book form or journal form and so on. And that's all behind a paywall, right? And so the big question here is, you know, is this the right system? If the public is paying, you know, my salary and I not only teach but do research, write and research, um, shouldn't the public have access to my, you know, writing and research and so on and so forth? And one of the things, talk to any librarian um, uh, that we're worried about is the increasing cost of education and the materials for education. So to get a subscription to a journal that I might publish in costs the library a lot of money. And, of course, if anyone who doesn't have a library card wants to access that article, they have to go through a paywall. And so that's kind of a form of sabotage, right? Because it's this idea of you're excluding people from it in order to derive an income stream. You're damaging the potential for knowledge uh, in order to derive an income stream. And then the ultimate uh, you know, form of sabotage is, of course, war. Um, and so we could look at how uh, you know, Middle Eastern wars – and this could be the Iraq war, the Afghanistan war, you know, um, any kind of war that you look at even back in 1991, the first Gulf War. Uh, whenever that happens, whenever you create conflict in the Middle East, the price of oil always goes up because the risk of its transport becomes higher and higher and higher. So basically, uh, as you increase risk, you increase reward, uh, in this case, from oil prices, and that equals fat profits for the oil corporations. So war is the ultimate form of sabotage. And Weberlin didn't have much to say uh, about that per se, but um, you know, we could look at war as another way of um, allowing uh, certain firms to profit um, from uh, uncertainty and increased levels of risk. Okay. So now um, we're just going to go through this quickly. The remaining slides are just um, more detailed examples of what I've just gone through. So if you look at the first one here, it says biotech firms, billions at risk, lobby states to limit generics. So there's this idea of, okay, well, we can have generics. They can be cheaper for people. But, you know, if we allow that to happen, well, then, you know, our profits go, um, you know, through the rabbit hole. Okay, um, and then next slide, if you flick, um, you'll get to the drug companies watching India's drug patent case. So again, this idea of India producing cheap HIV AIDS drugs for um, poor countries and poorer populations. So again, uh, you know, we can keep our eye on, on this case, which is ongoing. Uh, here's the example on slide 16, tapes reveal Enron's secret role in California's power blackouts. So again, we have to sabotage the, the provision of electricity for people in order to boost the price. There's the um, academic publisher's uh, article, so you can look that up and read it on your own time uh, if you're curious. And then here's some quotes here on sabotage and oil profits. And this is not about war, but it's internal documents from Texaco and Chevron that the U.S. Congress um, got on subpoena. And basically it shows within their internal documentation that there's an excess supply of you know refined oil. And what they need to do is create um, a shortage or, and, and make sure that prices um, um, get boosted up based on that artificial shortage. So there's two quotes that you can uh, read on your own time. And the next slide is also a quote from uh, the Senate inquiry into uh, refining capacity in the United States. And then the other thing that we could talk about is obsolescence. And there are three types of obsolescence. You probably heard of technological obsolescence. So the idea here is basically uh, we always want something new, right? And, and there's always some constant little improvement to, say, Microsoft, uh, you know, Microsoft Suite or to Adobe or to the iPad, iOS, you know, things like this. It's always, always, you know, something just slightly new and some would argue maybe better, uh, but it forces us or at least 
if not forces, maybe suggests to us that we we don't have the latest thing. And if we don't have the latest thing, we're not cool enough. Or if we don't have the latest thing, we don't look, you know, good in the eyes of our peers or, you know, we look like we're from 1920 or whatever it might be. So technological obsolescence uh, aids, you know, in corporate profitability. So does psychological and style obsolescence. And that just means that styles just keep constantly changing. And we can see that, you know, not only seasonally uh, in, uh, you know, fashion stores, but also within fashion itself. So as long as we, you know, keep changing what we think is cool or uh, hip or, you know, um, you know uh, fashionable in general, uh, as long as we keep changing that, that also allows corporations to garner more and more profit off our changing uh, sentiments and attitudes. And of course, that's shaped by marketing and advertising and so on and so forth. And this comes down to an analysis of fast fashion, which I won't really do here. Uh, I've got a clip up on Moodle, so please view that uh, at your leisure. And then third, there's planned obsolescence. And basically, you've probably always experienced this in your life. And if you talk to your grandparents, uh, they'll probably tell you something different. When they were kind of coming up and when my grandparents who were older than yours were coming up, things were built to last. You know, we still have the fridge my parents bought like 35 years ago. It's still running. It's probably sucking a lot of electricity, but nonetheless, it's still running. Um, nowadays, things are made to break. And if you don't believe me, you can read that book, Made to Break. And, you know, you've probably experienced it, though, in your own lives, whether that's, um, you know, batteries not being extended and, you know, Apple got in trouble for that. You've probably read that in the press. Uh, but just, you know, anything, I, I bought a fridge when I first arrived um, here in Australia about 10 years ago. It lasted me about six years. And then the the place, you know, to, to replace it, uh, sorry, to fix it, to repair it, um, would have cost more than buying a new fridge. So what do you do? You go in, you buy a new fridge, right? Anyways, so you get this idea of planned obsolescence that engineers are actually planning for certain things to break within a certain amount of time so it allows for repeat purchases. Okay. So those are the three obsolescences that we can start to think of when we think in relation to ownership, capitalism, and of course, sabotage, as Veblen uh, is talking about. That's, these are all three forms of Veblenian sabotage. And of course, we'd be remiss if we didn't discuss uh, COVID-19 and vaccinations and big pharma. As you're probably well aware, uh, there was an inequality of a vaccine rollout. Uh, primarily, the rich countries were first to negotiate with big pharma and receive the vaccine first. And that's primarily because of not only their corporate contacts, but also because they have the money in order to spend on the vaccines, which are priced by big pharma. Uh, the poor remain mostly unvaccinated, and this is particularly in Africa, and, and in particular of that, sub-Saharan Africa. And there was a battle in the global south. Uh, over 100 countries sought to create cheap generics by issuing what's called cons uh, compulsory licensing. What that means is that the government gives... Uh, permission to firms within its own country to override the patents that big pharma holds on the vaccine. So you can get a hold of the vaccine, you can reverse engineer it, figure out how to do it, and then produce cheap uh, and effective vaccines for the population. So we can see this massive, um, what would we call it, um, um, disparity obviously, between the global north and the global south. And again, Veblenian sabotage, you know, this idea of we're protecting our patents in order to protect the profits uh, for our investors. And of course, this is at a time of a global pandemic where we are told, you know, we're all in this together. And looking at the disparity between, you know, the vaccination in the global north and then uh, the vaccinations in the global south, we can see that we're not really all in this together, even though it is a global uh, health crisis. Again, we can see that profits are put above people. And in this case, the population or a significant amount of the population of the global south. So again, we can see how Big Pharma is kind of playing fast and loose, if you like, with the lives of some people around the world, particularly those who are most vulnerable and uh, those who are in poverty uh, in the global south. So that's a tremendous power to have. And again, it really shows us that notion of a Veblenian sabotage, which is, you know, there's a difference between producing for the betterment of humans, right? So that's his industry concept. 
and producing for business profit. And Veblen, as well as others, believe that that's the primary motive within capitalism. So something interesting to consider, and we've just seen it as we've gone through uh, you know, this global pandemic. There's certainly more evidence for it as well. And not surprisingly, we can see this reflected in Pfizer's, this is the example for today, Pfizer's uh, share price. So if you had invested right at the beginning of the pandemic on, you know, in March 2020, basically your, uh, the value of your shares would have more or less doubled. It depends on you know, if you held and when you sold or so on. But if you held even till this day, uh, you would have seen uh, a considerable increase uh, in your wealth. And so you can see it reflected here. Um, this is a five-year period, and obviously COVID wasn't with us during 2018-2019. Uh, um, but you can see that the share price has increased over 60% uh, over this five-year period. And compare this to an average rate of return uh, for the S&P over the last 30 years is 7%. So you're doing quite well if you invested in uh, the pandemic vaccines. So the general conclusion for today, if we flip to the last slide, is that it seems strange to think of capitalism and business as counterproductive when we seem to live in a time of immense wealth and productivity, right? And these commodities and services are all around us. So, um, you know, there's, you know, we can kind of see what Veblen is saying, but it's, it's difficult to kind of conceptualize sometimes that, you know, corporations would want to sabotage production. But there are three key questions to consider. Can a business firm survive without strategic sabotage? Think, of course, you know, how important patents are. What happens if we get rid of the patent system tomorrow and everybody can copy everyone else, right? Um, profits go to zero. Well, I can almost guarantee you that. So without that protection, right, um, these corporations and certain individuals who own patents wouldn't have that income stream or profitability. And then we could ask another question. Are we really producing at full capacity or reaching our full productive potential? And if you actually look, you'll find that we're never producing at full industrial capacity in any industrialized country. And one of the reasons for that is that there are limits to the market. Now, we'll see later why there are limits to the market. And yes, of course, you probably guessed it. It's based on people's ability to pay for goods and services. And people always have a limited amount of money to buy the goods and services outstanding on the market. But as we'll see later on, there is a real reason for this, and it's in the math of capitalism. Okay. And third, we could say perhaps the most important question to ask is not what a business corporation does, but what is it unwilling to do? So, for example, we think about pharmaceuticals and willing to solve the HIV AIDS crisis and so on and so forth. And there's other examples that we can think of uh, as well. But I think that's a very important question to ask. You know, what won't a corporation do? And I think you'd find some very, very interesting answers. Anyhow, that concludes uh, today's podcast on uh, Veblen and Capital and Sabotage. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. And Remember to check out those videos on Moodle. Take care, everyone.